The next speaker is Vincenzo from PATS, and uh, he, this was by far the most complex abstract. I can't say that I understood it, uh, but it's, it is about fractal social organization. So I, I just wonder if iMinds is in fractal social organization, are we? Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> so, good morning, Nili, good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you and um, to show you my thoughts about this concept of fractal social organization. So, um, there's um, many minds in here, many researchers, and we have uh, all our differences, of course, um, regarding our research part, paths and uh, all the, 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 the methods that we use, etc. But we have at least two things in common. One is, first of all, that we are all belonging to one organization, one fractal system, which is IMANS. The other thing is that we are all sitting on the, on the shoulder of giants, so all the things that we have been doing and, uh, are all based on results from the big giants of the past, and we have never to forget this. So, let's consider, for instance, this example. This is probably one of the greatest giants of the past, Aristotle. And uh, we, as researchers, we don't have just to accept the things that uh, the big giants have told us. We have to study, understand, analyze, and sometimes even question the lessons from these giants. Because if we want to get rid of uh, local minima, we have to sometimes reject theories and things. So, this is um, an important sentence from the metaphysics of Aristotle. But what does it mean, exactly? Exactly. Is this a law? Is this something that uh, regards all types of systems? Some types of system. Let, let's try and see. Let's consider an example. For instance, this one. Here we have a big, a large collection of parts. And of course, here we can see that uh, these big parts, when they are assembled together, will get something which is actually greater than the sum of the different parts. You get uh, extra services out of that. Okay, but let's analyze a little bit what this type of, uh, of case is. Here we have uh, mechanical parts that are bundled, assembled together. And um, this means that you get something that has a, a certain resilience. The, the identity of the social union will stay for a while, for instance, statistically for several years, short of an accident, of course. Um, uh, but this is, is not the general case. In the general case of a social system, you have to consider that the social part might not be mechanical parts. They might be intelligent uh, person, even minds, right? So in some cases, uh, these components would like to, to be detached from the whole. So we have to consider another, another component, another ingredient, I would say, something that keeps the things together. And this is um, the win-win, the concept of a social glue, something that is mutually beneficial between the parts and the part and the whole and, and so forth. So you need actually a mutualistic exchange between the part and the whole, something which is a, a return and is a bidirectional return for, for all stakeholders. Okay, this is a, a typical win-win situation. Um, of course, um, you're, you, you are very much accustomed to examples like ant and hantils or bee and beehives. Here we have um, social parts that are animals, so much more complex than a mechanical part. On the other hand, not that complex as minds, as human minds, etc. But here we have a win-win. Why? Because the bee can have a, a shelter and welfare from the beehive, and the beehive can find actors to play organizational roles. So this is uh, something that works. Also, you have a, a nice uh, phenomenon, which is identification. The bee identifies as itself with the, the greater social being. And it's uh, even, um, uh, this, this reaches the point that even the individual can sacrifice um, himself, uh, itself in this case, uh, for the sake of, of the greater social being. Okay, but this is um, a special case. Sometimes um, we have uh, less idyllic situations that have been celebrated in many uh, work of art, literature, and even the movies. Let's consider this case, for instance. Here, we have a win-lose situation, something which is completely different from the, different, from the past case. Here we have a complex person, uh, a man, which is embedded, nearly assembled into a factory. And um, here, clearly, we have um, a very different situation. Here, um, the part will try to flee, and sometimes will even try to fight the system, as it happened uh, in the past. So, what can we learn from this kind of, uh, of, of, of 
uh, not um, ideal situation. What is the big mistake here? I think that the mistake is that there is a, a systemic mismatch between the category of the part and the category of the system. You cannot treat a complex system as if it were a mechanical part, a cog, or place part numbers on, on their arms and awful things that have been done in the past, unfortunately. So, um, can, can you do something better? Well, of course you can. Um, for instance, um, if you if you cannot bring down um, the, the systemic degree of uh, of the component of the part, the other option is to bring up the, the systemic um, level of the organization of the whole. And uh, are there options? Yes, of course there are. For instance, communities. This is one of the options. What is community? Is something which is um, peer to peer. Um, you have just members there, and the roles, uh, the roles are not set by the organization, they are set by the context. And also, there is always a possibility for every member to take part and become activated, depending on the context, depending also on his volition or her volition and things like that. So, this is, um, <coughs> this is certainly ideal. And um, you, you might tell me, um, okay, but the, the case of, uh, of the slaving factor is something, let's say, a little bit too uh, far from, from our times. We don't have those things anymore. No, that is not true. If you consider traditional organizations, for instance, care organizations, you're going to see that sometimes they do something that resembles that scheme. Um, for instance, here, this wants to, to, to portray a care organization. We have two classes of people. The right-hand side uh, shows uh, the active class, the people that are supposed to do something. So doctors, nurses, um, um, uh, volunteers and so forth. But on the left-hand side, which actually is the greater part uh, of the system, you have the left sides, the people that are just considered as um, having no value. They are just on the receiving end of the service chain. They are just considered as objects. But you cannot do this because you, you develop anger, you develop problems. This is exclusion from the active part of society. It's both stupid and also is, is something which is uh, like branding, again, people uh, with bad attributes, like retired. I, that's an awful term. Retired from what? It's, uh, it's disgusting. So, um, what, you, what you can have, um, actually, is apply the concept of, uh, of community to this, to this situation. For instance, here we have uh, Linda, which is an elderly lady who is living in her home. Often she sits in her sofa and she watches TV. And, okay, she could talk to the, to the TV, but it's not that entertaining. She would like something better, let's say. So, she would like to, to talk with someone, to chat with someone. Okay, and then there's maybe someone else that would like to leave her house to, 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 to see the nature with this wonderful weather that we are having uh, nowadays. But she is living in a smart home, and there she feels sanctuary. She has uh, smart cameras like the ones that we have developing and, and using in the project Little Sister of Iman's. And, uh, and then she is um, guarded there, and then she's safe. So she would like to walk, but some, with someone else, with someone that can be a, a, a live, a living alarm, let's say, if she falls, that person can raise an alarm. So we have two parts in here. And suppose there is a, a, another part, which is a sort of a broker, and through some publish and subscribe mechanism, it receives notifications that are semantically annotated of uh, the people that are involved, um, where they live, um, and uh, what are their conditions, and so forth, and the requests that they have issued. This can be done, for instance, with some metaphors, for instance, choosing a channel um, of, of a t an interactive TV, the chat channel, or the walk channel, and so forth. So it can be easy. Okay, so let's suppose this is a, a semantic broker, and this um, broker receives these notifications, these uh, requests for services, and can assess that, for instance, chat and walk have some degree of similarity, and also they have been issued more or less in the same time frame, the people are not living very far from each other, so the thing maybe is possible that you can get the two parts together. And this is actually possible, and the two uh, persons are also compatible, socially speaking, let's say, then you have Again, a mutualistic exchange, and you have a win-win. And this is actually 
the nucleus of the idea <coughs> that we developed in the past and we call the mutual assistance community. So something that is um, not only based on, uh, on uh, people doing something to serve, to, 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 to run and help uh, other people, but also people that can help each other. Um, so a self-servicing mechanism that uses concepts like uh, symbiosis, mutualistic relationships, etc. To, to um, to, to also bring down the social costs and bring down also exclusion and things like that. So this is a very natural strategy, if you allow me to pun. And it's been used at all levels in, in nature, not only between individuals, between different species and so forth, but also between natural kingdoms like Plantia and Animalia here. So it's, um, it works. And what you get actually from unions like this is that you get something bigger, something greater than the sum of its parts. In this case, an ecosystem which is yet another block into a greater structure, a greater hierarchical structure that resembles a little bit the Matrioska dolls, one into the other and one greater than the, the others. So, we took this um, case and we try to model a little bit this, this type of system. Um, we created a sort of um, representation of the different parts that we have. For instance, here we have two part numbers zero, which means, for instance, two doctors. Two part number one, this is two nurses, for instance. And then eight patients, okay? So this is like a gene. Right? And uh, we, we use this gene, gene let's say, <coughs> to consider all the possible holes that you can get out of these parts. And we got pictures like this one. And indeed, this, which we call fractal social organization, is a structure, a mathematical structure, that has a number of extra properties. It's self-similar. Um, it is something that um, um, shows the same patterns, um, whatever the scale. So it's very important in our growing world of um, things that are getting to the billions. Okay, um, also there's uh, some other interesting properties, at least interesting for me. Um, if you consider this um, gene in here, uh, and you can see this other gene on, on the right and its representation, you see that as the gene, the genetic material, is included, the right one hand side is included in the left hand side, Likewise, the representation, the phenotypical construction that you get out of the genes is actually one contained into, into the other, which is one of the, 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 of the uh, laws that biologists are considering as um, the, the main reason why evolution evolves and why in nature we are getting always uh, more and more complex uh, uh, beings. And so we applied this to, to several cases, we, we made uh, several representations and here also we get the same result of uh, um, conservation of modularity even in this b-dimensional uh, representation. But the nice thing that we found in the end is that by measuring um, with some tool, the fractal dimension of these graphs, especially the 3D graphs, what you get is that they have a, a fractal dimension between 1.5 and 1.7, and they are, they, they are fractals in the mathematical sense. Um, so there's been a, a nice um, closure, let's say, <coughs> between the organizational aspects, management aspects, and the, the mathematical aspects. Okay, so now we can go back for a moment to, to the beginning in this cyclic um, presentation and go back to Aristotle. Now I think I know a little bit better what he meant with the sentence at the beginning. I think he meant that the whole, in some cases, given some preconditions, can be more than the sum of its parts. So, in a sense, the whole can behave like a beehive, if you allow me. So, but in order to, to do so, there must be some preconditions. The organization must play a clever part. So, before uh, I part from you, I just want you to, to take a look at this. Um, uh, if you are interested for, for more information, there's here the mathematical models and things. And, uh, okay, I thank you very much and I wish you a very nice continuation the whole day long.